This is the Oikolotor 3 nuclear power station in Finland. At her core is the Framatom EPR-1750. Once it begins commercial operation, it will become the most powerful nuclear reactor in Europe. Two EPRs are already operational in Taishan, China. Despite nuclear energy's proven track record in safety and the ability to reprocess and recycle waste, there are still people who are pathologically obsessed with spreading misinformation about nuclear power. Or maybe they are funded by the oil industry. Nobody really knows. Nevertheless, they claim nuclear energy is too dangerous, too much of a financial burden and that a large mix of renewables could make nuclear energy obsolete. These claims are, of course, wrong, because they are based on ignoring the fact that nuclear energy is just far more space efficient than renewable energy and that contextually, nuclear waste is nowhere near as bad as pollution produced not only by fossil fuels, but also renewable energy. Yes, despite what people tell you, renewables can pollute the environment, but we shall get to that later. There are four main types of commercial renewable energy. Tidal energy, hydroelectric, wind, and solar. Tidal and hydroelectric are the only two that can provide a consistent baseload energy supply, but their usage is limited by a nation's geography. You need many mountains, hills, rivers, and lakes. Take for example the Sihua Lake Tidal Power Station in South Korea. It is the largest in the world and has a nameplate capacity of about 250 megawatts of energy. South Korea's geography includes 10 river openings into the sea. Thus, if you could fit a similar tidal power station on each one, Korea could produce 2,500 megawatts. There are also seven hydroelectric dams with nameplate capacities ranging from 50 to 400 megawatts and one pumped storage hydroelectric dam providing 1,000 megawatts. So we have a combined amount of energy from hydroelectric of 2,017 megawatts. If Korea built a tidal plant on every single river opening, they could provide a total of 4,517 megawatts of baseload energy, or about the same as 2.5 EPR reactors. But it's okay, they can just put more and more underwater turbines on the same station. That won't have any consequences. Money! 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 <laughs> Some people also tout offshore tidal plants as a viable alternative. The problem is the most powerful of these is the O2 tidal platform and it produces a meager 2 megawatts meaning you would need to anchor 800 of these out at sea to produce the same amount of energy as one nuclear reactor. What these numbers show us is that a significant amount of expensive geoengineering and interference with marine and freshwater life is required to provide significant baseload energy to match a few nuclear power stations. A nation like the United Kingdom has a rolling energy demand averaging about 30,000 megawatts which would require about 19 EPR reactors to supply. But imagine trying to provide this solely with tidal and hydroelectric. Whether you are in the United Kingdom or South Korea, there'd be more concrete in the rivers than there would water. It should also be noted that so far I've been talking about installed capacity and not capacity factor. The maximum amount of energy a tidal power station can produce could be 250 megawatts, but because tidal energy has a capacity factor of around 30%, they produce an amount of energy comparable to a 75 megawatt station with a 100% capacity factor. Let me show you what I mean by switching to gigawatt hours. The Sihua Tidal Station has a nameplate capacity roughly one-fifth of the Torness nuclear power station in Scotland. The tidal plant provides 552 gigawatt hours every year, but the nuclear power station does not provide five times as much energy, but rather 12 times as much energy, 6,679.35 gigawatt hours. What these numbers show is the number of tidal plants you'd need to match a single nuclear reactor may be even larger than you are made to believe, and this is a running theme of renewable energy low capacity factor and hogging land. So let's move on to the problems with wind power. 
Wind turbines cannot provide baseload energy due to changing wind speed throughout the year. Take for example the Hornsey Project 2. It has 165 turbines spread over 287.1 square miles. Each turbine is rated at 8 megawatts. Meaning to match the nameplate capacity of a large nuclear reactor, you would need to construct 200 of them. But that is just the nameplate capacity and it assumes the optimum conditions. In reality, wind speed ebbs and flows considerably. Here is a graph showing the rolling energy demand and the energy provided by wind power for the 1st, 15th and 28th day of each month. Despite the UK possessing around 11,000 onshore and offshore wind turbines for an installed capacity of 28,000 megawatts, for the majority of the time they collectively produce under 7,000, if anything at all. I guess we could just double the installed capacity. Oh. Well, moving on. Solar power. Oh, how I hate you. Here is a field. We could leave it alone for birds of prey to use as a hunting ground. We could even plant some trees and make a nice little forest. After all, in a world where biodiversity has fallen by a horrifying 70%, creating more space for nature is an important aspect of saving the planet. But instead, we shall just cover it in solar panels. Wow, this is... This is so much better for nature. Not only are solar farms a bad use of space, but in terms of energy generation, they are terrible. Here is a solar farm in the notoriously sunny United Kingdom, where solar power has a capacity factor of about 10%, the Shotwick Solar Farm. When compared to the Torness nuclear power station, we can see that both have a similar land area. The solar farm produces 68.59 gigawatt hours every year. The nuclear power station produces 6,679.35 gigawatt hours per year. That is nearly 100 times as much energy for the same amount of land, meaning that for the solar farm to produce as much energy as the nuclear power station, it would have to expand in size by another 21,208 acres. That is land that could be used for farming or turned into a forest. In warmer parts of the world, solar is better. The Topaz farm in California can produce a similar amount of energy to a nuclear power station. It is still 25 times larger, but at least there is room for it in a desert. But within the United Kingdom, marketing solar panels as eco-friendly because you can place them above car parks or on top of suburban homes is a joke, because both car culture and low-density housing are extraordinarily bad for the environment. Taking up space which could be returned to nature instead of being covered in concrete and asphalt. Putting solar panels on top of such infrastructure is the epitome of greenwashing. And speaking of concreting over everything, energy storage is just as bad. Remember the graph? You can see there are high points and low points. Some believe we could store energy from when the wind and solar conditions are optimal and then feed it back into the grid when conditions are suboptimal. That way, energy storage can provide a baseload energy supply similar to nuclear. On paper, it might sound like a good idea, but in reality it suffers from the same problems as renewable energy. It uses too much land. The two most respectable systems are molten salt thermal storage and battery arrays. First, let's take a look at a typical thermal storage system, the Gima Solar Heliostat plant in Spain. The plant uses solar mirrors to direct sunlight towards a central point within a tower. Salt is then pumped from a cold silo up to the central point and is heated by the mirrors to 565 degrees Celsius. The salt is then pumped to a hot silo for storage. When needed, the salt is pumped through a heat exchanger to produce steam for a 20 megawatt turbine for 15 hours. Now barring the mirror arrays, the site has an area of roughly 2.5 acres. Wow, that's so good, right? Truly this proves we don't need nuclear energy. Oh yeah, sorry, the Okiloto 3 power station produces 80 times as much electricity. It provides that energy without having to rely on the sun shining every day in order to charge a bunch of silos full of more salt than a Greenpeace campaigner. 
The reactor and turbine set of Oikoloto have a land area of roughly 5 acres, so it provides 80 times as much energy and is roughly twice as large. Maybe you could simply build bigger silos and a larger turbine, but if you wanted to build enough of these systems to match the power of a nuclear reactor, and to provide that energy for 24 hours instead of 15, the land area would have to be 270 acres. That is 55 times larger than the area of Oikoloto, and as far as I can tell, thermal storage like this is only ever used with heliostats. Moving on. Wind farms make use of traditional batteries to store off-grid energy, and they are even worse. The Hornsdale Power Reserve in Australia covers roughly 1.5 acres of land, and it can provide 193.5 megawatts of electricity for one hour. One hour. Scaling up its land area to provide the nameplate capacity of the nuclear reactor, and for 24 hours, would make the site 287 acres, that is 57.4 times larger. Congratulations, your wind farm energy storage can now provide the same amount of energy as a nuclear power station for one day-night cycle. I wonder what happens on the second day? Well, the nuclear power station is chugging along just fine. How about the battery farm? Oh no, the wind isn't blowing, and the batteries haven't recharged. What a shame, what a shame. If you are in a nation hostile to nuclear energy, I guess you'll just have to burn some coal and gas. How eco-conscious of them. Having seen all the evidence that nuclear energy is vastly more space efficient whilst having one of the lowest lifetime greenhouse gas outputs for all forms of energy generation, we are left with a rather simple question. If you really care about saving the planet, but also want to produce electricity, which would you prefer to build? This? Or this? Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed the video, why not leave a like and a comment? I have a further two videos planned on the subject of nuclear energy, so if you would like to see those, do consider subscribing.